Welcome everybody um, to our uh, workshop, uh, to our webinar this afternoon. Uh, my name is Dan Burrows. I'm a lecturer in social work at the School of Social Science in Cardiff University. Uh, I'm just going to be chairing uh, the session, which is going to be run by uh, Professor Robin Miller and uh, Paula Thompson Butler. Um, I think uh, there may be quite a few people who are joining the uh, the webinar who don't really know what Exchange Wales is. So just by way of explanation, um, Exchange Wales brings leading researchers together with practitioners and service users to share expertise, research, evidence and care experiences. Exchange provides free, high quality training to support the ongoing development of social care professionals. Our events and resources enrich skills while foregrounding the lived experience of care experienced people. Exchange is led by the Cascade Research Centre at Cardiff University and is generously funded by the Welsh Government through Health and Care Research Wales. Most of our previous events have focused on children's social care, but we're very pleased to be focusing on adult social care for this conference series on strengths-based approaches. So our title today is Adapting the System, the Role of Practice and Senior Leaders in Embedding Strength-Based Working. And I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Robin Miller, who is a Professor and Director of Global Engagement for the College of Social Sciences at Birmingham University, and Paula Thompson Butler, who is a social worker and associate of the uh, Social Care Institute of Excellence. Um, so they're going to um, go through their talk um, until about quarter to two. Um, and at quarter two, we'll then have opportunities for questions. So if you have a question to ask, uh, we won't interrupt the, the, uh, the, the talks as it goes on, but basically um, if you pop your questions in the chat, and then from quarter two onwards, I will read some of those uh, questions from the chat out for uh, Robin and Paula to address. So um, thanks very much, folks, and, and over to Robin and Paula. Okay, thanks, Dan, for that introduction and for the opportunity to talk to people today. And yeah, I look forward to people's um, thoughts and uh, and insights and, and critiques, really, what we're saying in terms of leadership and strength-based practice. So people who don't know me, a bit more of my background. So uh, I've been at university for about 10 years. Uh, I'm an applied health and social care academic uh, based in the Department of Social Work and Social Care. Uh, and I've got three main areas of interest, one of which is to do with integration uh, and collaboration. So how do we support um, health and social care professionals, but also um, statutory sector and voluntary sector uh, and wider services such as housing to collaborate better together. Um, secondly, I'm really interested in um, implementation. So how do we take those fantastic kind of ideas and thoughts and visions that we have at a regional or national level and actually translate those um, into changes in practice and better outcomes for people? And the third thing I'm interested in is the idea of leadership um, and how do we enact leadership within a social care and integrated care setting? So the topic for today just responds to all the things I'm interested in. So it's been a real joy to kind of pull together the slides for the presentation. So I will sort in a minute shortly talk you through what we're going to, to cover today. Paula, do you want to give people a little bit of background to who you are? Because it's always quite helpful, I think, to get a sense of them of who's who's sharing and, and where they're coming from. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Robin. So my name's Paula, and um, by profession, I'm a, a qualified social worker, and I've been qualified for 22 years. And it's only recently that I left frontline mm -hmm. practice. Um, I'm very passionate about making um, or, or supporting Frontline to do what we are supposed to be doing under the legislation that, you know, that underpins our practice, which is to empower individuals so that they can live lives that are meaningful to them with least intrusion from the state as is possible. So I've worked with Skype for seven years as a trainer and then recently wanted to kind of become more involved at, at a strategic level to look at how we can support organisations to enable their operational staff to do the jobs that, that, that people join um, this career pathway for. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And Paul and I are both involved in a leadership programme that we're going to talk about a bit later. So that's my reason for both here today. So let me just get up my slides. Okay, so I'll move over there. Um, great. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today, we're going to start off thinking about um, leadership in social work and social care. 
uh, and what are the connections with strengths-based practice um, and how we translate that um, into meaningful change in the ground. Then we're going to think about um, leadership development because it's, we, it's one thing to say that we need good, strong, proactive leadership, but how do we actually support people to be able to demonstrate the leadership behaviours that are required um, to support strength-based practice. And then we'll come back at the end with a few other opportunities that we are aware of that are coming up within Sky University of Birmingham to carry on this conversation um, and to further engage in the work in leadership and strength-based practice. Um, and as Dan said, please do post your questions and thoughts as we go, we'll pick those up at the end. So um, when we think about strength-based practice, and I think the, the first thing is clearly what is strength-based practice? Um, and within, uh, I mean, across the UK, there's different ways of, of defining that. But generally, there is a, a commonality uh, regarding the key principles of strength-based practice. Um, so we've got a focus on what individuals uh, and their families um, aspire to, what they see as being important. Um, there is a uh, hope that we can support people to build on their informal um, and community resources. Um, and there's a, a sense of it's a more of a collaborative, engaged relationship between the professional um, and the individual and the family rather than being a kind of professional gift model. Um, and even if we have a particular definition that, that, that alters in some ways, those core, core principles are reflected in, in strength based practice in adults, but also in children's as well. Um, and when we, we look at strength-based practice and the fact that most uh, local authority areas um, in each of the whole nations are trying to move to that model, we see a number of common challenges that people find on the ground. Um, the first is that um, there can be challenges around the existing processes that we have in adult social care, uh, which are often based around um, the old care management model of a formal assessment that connects people with and with a set of criteria or eligibility um, in which then the local authorities will agree or not agree to provide funding and then the service will be coordinated. And when we try to move to strength-based practice, which is something that's much more, uh, should be much more creative, much more flexible, uh, much more um, responsive to the individual in their local context, um, what we often find is that the existing recording systems and the paperwork actually make it quite difficult for practitioners to behave in a more strength-based way. Um, and similarly for, for services that support people, whether from the voluntary sector and or social care providers, again, the commissioning contracts um, often are much more are focused on a particular set of activities, which again, takes away some of that flexibility. So one of the challenges we find is that the existing processes make it difficult for people to demonstrate strength-based principles. Um, the second thing we find uh, com commonly is that just because people are already so busy, uh, we're all so aware of adult social care services, of the impact of austerity, um, of increasing demands through an older population, through more people coming through from childhood with complex disabilities, due to people's kind of complex social issues and, and multiple conditions, etc. But it can make it very difficult um, for local authorities and the partners to actually have enough time to, to try to change things because they're so busy responding to immediate crises that they can then uh, make it very difficult to transform the services in the way that we want to provide them. And the third thing that you commonly find um, when you research strength-based practice um, is that just there is also an element to which um, the social care workforce have been expected to work in a particular way. Um, and whilst generally people will support the principles of strength-based practice, sometimes there's a lack of confidence, particularly around um, issues of risk uh, and being perhaps more creative um, and um, less formulaic in the way you respond to risks. Um, they give people a kind of lack of confidence and I can cause them quite a lot of anxiety. So the, these are issues that we've got to address if we're actually going to fundamentally embed strength-based practice within adult social care. Um, and part of that, and we find this time and time again from research, and if you look at any um, evaluation study or any um, review of strength-based practice implementation, what you find is that leadership is a major element of helping people to move um, from the previous way of working to more directly reflecting these strength-based principles. And just as an example of one study that we've done at University of Birmingham, um, we completed um, a study um, for the Department of Health Research uh, Programme in which we looked at um, new models of prevention within 10 local authority areas. Um, and a lot of that was trying to move to more strength-based practice. 
Um, and we published this paper last year, which we compared the approach of two local authority areas to try to embed local area coordination, uh, which I know um, has also um, been um, introduced within Wales as well, which is basically where we've got a single person within a local locality who's a point of contact for informal advice uh, for people who, who've got a particular need um, and who will try and support them. And we'll also try and develop community resources if they identify a gap. And what we find within these two localities is there was the, the same model of local air coordination, same principles, very similar kind of model in terms of what the actual delivery would look like. But the, the extent to which they were able to successfully embed strength, um, local air coordination was quite different. Um, and what we find was that a major um, difference between the two areas was the role of leadership and the way that was enacted in terms of the implementation process. Um, and in the area that was most successful, what you found was that there was leadership um, represented across the different parts of the social care system, which enabled it to transform the way that people delivered on the ground. So we found, for example, senior leaders were really important in terms of setting the overall vision for the local authority and saying these are the principles we want to follow, for allocating resources so that there was money there to support local air coordination, to say that these activities were organizationally legitimate, so they were seen as being, um, you know, this way of working was seen as being um, endorsed by uh, the local authority, um, and also in terms of engaging external partners. And then below them, the service leaders, so the people who were in charge of multiple teams or direct services, translated these visions and these aspirations for strength-based principles into practice. Um, so they broke it down into more implementation plans. Um, they also encouraged creativity within the teams and said to the team leaders, look, we want you to be able to do things differently and support your frontline staff. Um, and they also had an interesting role at the service leader level of actually re-educating new senior leaders who came in, because we know that often what happens is a, a director of adult social services equivalent will come in and say, look, I don't think this is the way we should be doing things. I think we should be doing this different approach, which is perhaps what I used in my previous local authority. But actually in the locality that was successful, they were then re-educated by the service leaders to say, well, well, we hear what you're saying, but actually we've got this really good approach that we've been building and starting to implement across our locality called local area coordination. Practice and team leaders, absolutely key because they won and they supported the frontline staff to be more creative and to cope with the different issues that arose but also they were quite entrepreneurial so they would go out into the local community to engage with different resources and different um, community leaders um, and find out new ways of engaging them um, in terms of the the role of adult social care but also the people who, who came forward for support and then finally the idea of citizen leaders so people who've got lived experience of social care we're, we're really core to both the recruitment, to the kind of setting out the vision for local area coordination and also in its oversight and development. So what you get from this is that when we think about leaders, sometimes what we do is we just default to the senior people. We say, ah, it's down to those kind of senior managers and the cabinet member for social care. They're the people who really are the leaders and they are the leaders, but actually all these other levels have to be involved as well and supported if we're going to make strength-based practice um, a reality. And when we think about leadership, there's again, there's, there's we could we could have at least a whole a whole day at least um, on leadership and what leadership is. But the definition that we we are we use commonly at the University of Birmingham and at SCAR are quite comfortable with as well is this idea of leadership. Um, it's a process. It's an interactive relationship um, between an individual with another group of individuals to achieve a common goal. So it's not just about people with a formal authority, people in um, established kind of formal management roles who can demonstrate leadership, but actually um, people at all levels of the, the adult social care system could potentially inspire um, and encourage others um, if they have a particular vision that, that's in tune with what those people believe and they've got a new way and a new idea of doing things. Um, and leadership is also not just about the leaders, it's also about the followers. And I think one of the things we find uh, in recent years in terms of leadership research is that the followers are almost as, um, uh, as important as the leaders, because it's the, the people who choose to follow that vision who will say, OK, so I don't necessarily agree with everything you're saying, but I do believe in your overall um, aspiration and your overall values and who put their support behind the leader that actually makes this go from one person's idea to a common um, common initiative and a sense of momentum. So I think the main thing for this is that leadership is a, an interactive relationship um, between leader and follower. It's not just the leader setting out and dictating what people do. 
And leadership is a huge issue, whether you're talking about strength-based practice or indeed other issues. And what we find is uh, in relation to general organizational studies um, is that leadership is perhaps one of the most influential dynamics um, to setting the overall culture of the organization. Um, so leaders um, and the way that leaders engage with the, 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 the wider, wider services will set out the kind of and, and, and enforce the different kind of normative rules um, the way that decisions are made, what is valued, what is um, what is challenged within an organisation. So leadership is seen as absolutely key to people's um, experience of being at work, of their well-being at work, but also in terms of how their practice um, is uh, demonstrated and how they reflect and interact with other people. And similarly, leadership is also seen as being absolutely key um, when we try and do something differently. Um, and the, the Monroe Review, which, as you'll know, I'm sure, looked at um, and child protection services, particularly in England, was saying that actually we need to move from, from something that's much more bureaucratic, top-down service to something that's much more of a learning environment. And leadership and the way that leaders um, engage with people, the way that they cope and respond to when things haven't gone so well, um, and the way they try and derive learning from that is absolutely fundamental to trying to transform and to do something differently. So leadership is, is a really key part of any organizational dynamic and indeed any partnership dynamic. Because again, if you look at any studies of um, um, good integrated care, what you'll find is that they generally say that there was a, a good set of local leaders who were committed to doing things differently, who knew and trusted each other, and similarly, where you find that integrated care didn't work, you don't find that, or you find the opposite in terms of mistrust, uh, a lack of willingness to share resources, and a lack of a common agenda. So leadership and leadership and culture are absolutely key to doing anything differently, and particularly within um, strength-based practice. Uh, now, we've been doing a, a set of work at the University of Birmingham thinking about social work leadership um, in particular, and we totally recognise that social work is only one profession within the social care context, and we've also got occupational therapists, we've got nurses, and we've also got a whole set of staff that may not have a formal professional label, but actually are incredibly committed and able uh, people. Um, but we were looking at social work leadership because we were really interested to see how does leadership um, play out within the social work profession you know within a profession that says or, or hopes to be a value-based profession um how does how does leadership play out within that so we've done some work and there's a paper there at the bottom with a link um, which we tried to come up with a, a definition of social work leadership um which tries to reflect the values of social work so it's things like um uh, using leadership in a way that we can respond to the interests and aspirations of people and families. Um, the social work leadership should be achieved through co-production with communities, collaboration with other professionals and constructive conflict of unjust inequality. So that idea of what does leadership look like when it comes in the social work profession and all the kind of background to what that has. And when we look at leadership and social work, it's actually pretty poorly defined uh, in our view. Um, in terms of what, what, what is it and how is it different within that context. Um, there's many um, commentators have said that actually there's a bit of a, there could be a crisis of leadership within social work um, because actually the context has often been one in which local authorities in particular and indeed children's trusts in, in England as well have been much more focused on people being compliant with a set of procedures and policies uh, and there's been a very risk averse nature um, to the practice environment. Now, I think that is changing. I think that's definitely changing the last few years, but that does not um, encourage people to be bold leaders who are courageously going to think of doing things differently, when actually organizational cultures are much more kind of bureaucratic and process um, driven. Similarly, within qualifying social work education, there's perhaps been a, a traditional gap in terms of encouraging social work students um, to see themselves as leaders and to understand how they demonstrate their leadership within their day-to-day -day practice. Um, uh, some people have commented that perhaps social workers are seen as having less status than some of those traditional professions that we have, such as uh, medicine being the, the, the obvious one, but also nursing as well, and therefore perhaps having less um, influence in those professionals. And then finally, this comment, which comes from um, Colby Peters, who's an American social work academic, who's done a lot of work on leadership, is that 
what we sometimes find in leadership um, teaching and leadership writing is that we take um, bus- uh, models from private business, particularly private American business, and say, well, do those always fit within the social work context and social work values? And therefore, that can sometimes put social workers off the idea of leadership because they feel it just doesn't reflect who they are and what they aspire to do in their professional life. The good thing is, I think, that in terms of social work leadership, that they're, they're, they're very promising signs. So we're doing some work um, across the four notions of the UK with the British Association of Social Workers. We're trying to understand how each of the home nations has understood leadership and how it's trying to support it. And what we found is that there is a genuine interest in the policy and practice leaders within each of the four nations to think about well, what does leadership look like within social work and indeed the broad adult social care um, uh, sector as well. We're also seeing um, increasing investment in in post-qualifying programs at both a senior level, so those people who are at directors or who are aspiring to be directors, but also that absolutely crucial middle management, middle tier level, people who supervise the practice of others, who are actually possibly the most important leaders in terms of helping people to do something different. Very little research, though, into leadership in social work and social care, and we found, oh, maybe five papers at most and um, that actually focused on that leadership within this um, sector and also a real kind of expectation that perhaps social care social work leaders could contribute to integrated care systems um, because of their understanding of different perspectives of their ability to bring together um, uh, different stakeholder groups or to cope constructively with conflict but were social work social care leaders actually able to take that up Now, what is positive thing about uh, leadership is that there's a lot of thinking being done um, in other um, sectors, uh, both in in the healthcare world, but also in the private sector, in terms of what are the theories of leadership that we could apply. Um, And when you look at social care leadership across the the, the four nations of the UK, what you find is there's some common models that are being drawn upon. So the idea of compassionate leadership, in particular Michael West in the King's Fund, who's done a lot of work in Wales I'm aware of, Uh, the idea of systems leadership. So what is it we need to do differently to go beyond our organisational interests? The idea of distributed leadership. So going back to that um, case study I presented on local air coordination, it's not just about the senior people, it's about distributing leadership opportunities to to throughout the organisation. And then um, the idea of citizen leadership. So we're asking people and communities to influence what we do and how we do it. But how do we support them to have a meaningful voice and to have the confidence in order to demonstrate that leadership? And we think as well there's another model of leadership that actually plays out and could be quite relevant to strength-based practice. And that's something called um, adaptive leadership. And this actually has come uh, from uh, initially from private sector, from the Harvard Business School, but has been deployed um, in a number of different public sector settings um, across the states, but internationally indeed in the UK. And the reason we think adaptive leadership, and I've interested people's comments at the end if you've got an engagement with it, which is quite irrelevant, because what adaptive leadership says is leadership is all about change. It's all about doing something differently. But when we try and, uh, and do things differently, there's different types of challenges that we've got to overcome. So some of the challenges we have to overcome are more technical challenges. So we, we kind of know what the answer is. Um, we know what resources that we need, and we might struggle sometimes to have enough of those resources or to coordinate them sufficiently. But actually, if we did have the time and the, the money uh, and the capacity and the willingness, we could respond to those challenges. Alongside those, we have things called adaptive challenges. And what that basically says is that we've got this opportunity, this challenge, but to to respond to that, we have to do things fundamentally different. We have to move away from our previous practice in order to do something very differently um, than in the future in order to make the most of that opportunity to respond to that challenge. And in the middle, you have something that's both technical and adaptive. So some of the answers we know but some of the answers we don't know. Now, why we think this is really relevant to strength-based practice is when you speak to local authority areas um, and you say, tell us about strength-based practice, they have this kind of mixed message. So part of them says, well, in adult social care, we've always tried to be strength-based. We've always seen the importance of engaging with people, of building their informal resources, of trying to work with them. But we also recognise that we weren't doing that well enough that actually we need to do something different if we're actually going to put those values fully into practice. 
And that's why we think adaptive leadership is actually a really important model with this, because adaptive leadership says some of what you do, you want to preserve. And I think there are parts of adult social care practice previously that we would want to preserve. But there's other bits of it, particularly the bureaucratization, uh, particularly the kind of focus on eligibility criteria or on professional gift models that we definitely want to discard. We don't need those. We don't want those in gender based practice. And we have to adopt new ways of working if we're going to achieve a truly strength based model, this, like this kind of creativity, this innovation, this engaging with people and being willing to do things different and let answers emerge. That's what we need if we're going to be strength based in what we do. And adaptive leadership as a model recognizes that. It recognizes that some things can be maintained, some things have to be discarded, and some things have to be developed. And the other thing that we think is really good about adaptive leadership is this is that it doesn't say, that it's down to the senior leader to come up with the answers. Because if they knew the answers, they would have a technical response and they would use their authority to implement that. That's not what it is. What it's saying is that the leadership role is to help people to recognize that they have to do something differently, is to bring them together, is to give them forums for discuss discussion, is to keep their focus on what they, on, on the kind of overall outcome they need to achieve. And it's helping people to cope with the anxiety because you know people are really busy in their day jobs they have lots of responsibilities the idea of moving away from existing practice even if it's limited to doing something creative different can actually be very very worrying and can cause people huge concern and adaptive leadership as a model says yeah we recognize that we still need to move on but actually as a leader one of my jobs is to try and contain that anxiety and help me to use that in a positive way going forward so adaptive leadership is another model not really deployed much in adult social care in, this, in, in the UK um, as yet, but we think could have real relevance um, in terms of uh, leadership for strength-based practice. And I'm just going to hand over to, um, to Paula because the Sky have been doing some particular work about what strength-based leadership looks like, which we thought would be good, good to share at this point before we go on to talk about how do we develop strength-based practice in, in, in leaders. So Paula, over to you. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you. So um, Sky Insights published a briefing on strength-based leadership in 2021, and we're currently working to update this and hopefully it will be released in the very near future. But the 2021 paper identified that the success of practice and senior leaders in embedding strength-based work could largely be um, attribute, attributed to the, the four key factors that you can now see on your screen. So it requires clarity in terms of the vision that the organisation has, okay, and making sure that there are effective systems in place to be able to sustain it. So we need to be clear about how we do things around here. And those plans that we have are underpinned or should be underpinned by um, being people focused, you know, um, having relationships, having conversations with individuals that open the doors to meaningful conversations about what matters to the individual that draws on the service and the communities within which we sit, rather than undertaking our assessments based on what is wrong and what services the sector can give to the community or the individual. So our legal framework is underpinned by strengths-based practice, which we have a duty to adhere to, um, but we're not, you know, we're not quite there yet. And that is um, something that you, the white paper putting people at the heart of care is attempting to address within, within England. So creating the vision requires true co-production, which is uh, really, it really is an us mentality, not a token gesture. And to be an us approach to this, it's about drawing on um, expert by, you know, on, with the experts by experience, those that have got experts of what their individual circumstances have on, you know, the impact that it's having on their own lives to find out what's important to them and for them and to co-produce the vision. So being clear about what the vision is and co-producing that with the communities within which we sit so that we can be clear and we can define how we are going to do things around here. So evidence indicates that local places which are making progress on strength-based ways of working have clear co-produced narratives which explain what they're trying to achieve, but not only what they're trying to achieve, but how they're going to achieve it. 
So to make strengths-based approaches meaningful through partnership action, um, successful leaders need to work with their partners, okay, and acknowledge that many of the issues that we have within our organisations and within the public sector cannot be solved by one person or one institution. So again, it's not a them and us approach to working, but it's a unified us using resources in a different way to work towards promoting individual or individual well-being and not just the provision of services. So the vision and plan becomes more meaningful when we change and improve how we work and how we build relationships. And it's been identified that when organisations do not buy into the vision as a whole, perhaps because the vision was created from a top down and, and not side by side with the community and the operational resources. Okay, that when that doesn't happen, when it's not created together, there's no buy-in. The briefing that we produced as well identified that there are times when the vision is only owned by a small group of leaders and that when those leaders leave, the vision often goes with them. So Alex Fox, OBE, reflected on why some of the plans do not last and he noted that they go flat because they never go beyond the vision, that the vision may be there but there's no roadmap as to how it will be achieved, by whom and by when. So to embed strengths-based working, leaders need to ensure that they buy in, that the, you know, that they buy into it and that there is a clarity of the vision and that the vision is co-produced. So the local um, health and care partnership in Gateshead requested that we um, support them um, with an independently facilitated and co-produced piece of work to change the way in which agencies and services respond to people who need help from lots of different services. So this led to a move away from many um, agencies treating individuals in, in separate environments, um, in separate service settings, to, to one setting that puts the, the person at the heart of, of the intervention that is required. To embed strengths-based working, organisations need to build on the relationships that they already have in the communities identifying the strengths that each, you know, um, each person that contributes towards success has, finding out what their skills and experiences are, looking at what the gaps are, and then figuring out together how we're going to fill those gaps. Organisations need to challenge themselves to reach out to those peoples and communities where those relationships are perhaps not yet established, so that they can again work together to find out, well, what do these individuals and these communities want? What can they contribute to it? And again, how can we get there together? So to embed strengths-based working, leaders need to take action to get the basics in place if positive change is going to happen, okay? We need, as an organisation, as a sector, to have better systems and processes and the opportunity for learning and development, not just for those that, that sit within a professional role within those organisations, but also for the communities that we are supporting. And we also need to encourage that there are clear measures in place so that if we're doing an action and an activity that we can measure the impact of that to gather the data and the feedback to find out if new ways of working are making a positive difference to people. And if we're going to do that, we need to be making sure that we're having the right conversations with people who use the service, work in it and who rely on social care support. This enables a celebration of the successes, but it also provides the opportunity for that continual review so that we can sustain and improve plans and actions. So on the slide that you can see at the moment, um, the briefing that I've, I've mentioned before identified that to successfully embed strength-based approaches, the following elements are needed. So of course we need resource and assets and they can come in very many different shapes and sizes. And it's about utilizing those resources and assets so that the activities are meaningful, that the outputs from the identified activities do actually lead on to have a positive impact. Local authorities spend around £20 billion a year on adult services, and yet we're still not there in terms of embedding strengths-based working. The sector can support the development of commissioning plans and market position statements that support strengths-based approaches. 
be creative, think outside the box, take the, it's not a one size fits all approach to developing new ways of working, drawing on resources that people currently have in terms of their skills, knowledge and experience and working in partnership so that we can move away from fixing a problem and being deficit focused in what we're doing, but to achieve, um, as, you know, to achieve lives that promote as, in, as much independence as is possibly um, feasible and promoting individual well-being. So think local, act personal, identified that um, there are, that are required, um, sorry, TLAP identified key actions that are required to adopt a strengths-based, asset-based approach to care and support. And this work is focused on, and I quote, it's founded on the belief that every area and its citizens can achieve more when they combine their experiences, um, time, cre creativity and resources. Okay. So one of the big three changes that they recommend involves ensuring the assets that we, we have within the community um, that, you know, that we're working together with them and following a social value act to um, inform the building of much more diverse and inclusive ranges of support. So strength based approach can't be developed by visions alone. And so the way in which we spend public sector money um, needs to change so that we can work towards promoting independence. Yeah, and I'd probably go on, should I go on to the leadership programme now, Paul? Is that all right? Just yeah, of course you can. Fantastic, yeah, yeah definitely. So that's really helpful, Paul, in terms of thinking about what we, what we need for, to, to embed strength and pride. And part of that, as we talked about, is the idea of, of leadership. And one of the things we identified at Sky at uh, University of Birmingham was that we, we talk about the role of leadership, we recognise that. We recognise we need to do something differently, but what support do we give to our practice leaders in particular in order to demonstrate these new ways of working? So we uh, worked with, um, we were lucky to get funded from the West Midlands Social Work Teaching Partnership. Um, and I know sometimes people can be a bit cynical about these kind of partnership bodies, but actually in our region, the West Midlands Teaching Partnership, which brings together employers and educators for social workers across the region, was actually really helpful. And what it identified was speaking to their practice partners that um, the what was really required was a leadership program that enabled them to support their frontline workers. So we were commissioned uh, Sky and University of Birmingham to develop such a program. Um, and we started off with an initial cohort of social workers for the region um, who were drawn from not just adults, um, but also children, family social work, which was a fantastic bit of the program actually, because it brought together people who too little do they get chance to, to spend time together understanding their practice. Um, and now what we've done is we've, we've developed a programme, um, which we'll talk about now to give you an idea what it involves. Um, and we're now running an open cohort basis. Um, so we've got people from local authorities and from across the country, and either we people come on to individually, or they'd be commissioned to come on as a team from a local authority. And alongside social workers, we've got OTs, nurses, um, and um, also frontline care providers um, who are taking part of the programme. So Paul is going to tell you a little bit of the, the highlights of what we've tried to bring in. I guess what we're trying to do with this is we're trying to think about, if we know what these leadership um, contribution to strength based practice is we understand some of the ways of developing leadership how do we apply that within a social work and social care context so paul i'm going to hand over to you for the for the next couple of slides okay no problem thank you so with the research that birmingham university and sky have gathered they've ident we've collectively identified that there needs to be a core set of behaviors that leaders demonstrate in their practice to enable us to embed strength based working so being able to recognize what your strengths are and how you can build on them through the being able to forge those relationships with, with other professionals across our networks, but also with those relationships that, you know, that we've not yet established, being able to facilitate the practice of others, you know, on that pro-social modeling, you know, demonstrate what you would like your organization to demonstrate and to lead teams to build on, on their collective strengths. So recognizing the strengths within their teams and building upon them, but also being able to have that um, ability to make change. So making positive changes in my organization and wider system. So we created a um, program that lasts around seven months and each participant is expected to commit 15 days to this programme. As you can see on the slide, it's a mixture of activity. There are four contact days where we come together as a group 
for three hours and we go over the core theme for each of those contact sessions. And between each of those contact sessions, participants go away with a work-based task um, based around supporting them to achieve change in terms of strengths-based practice. So part of this as well is making sure that participants have got a sponsor for the course so that they've got that additional layer of accountability, but also that additional space to be able to reflect on what they've learned and how they're going to be able to implement it in their practice. So the programme is run over three main sections. So we've got an introduction to leadership. We've got um, in terms of leadership of self, okay, leadership of teams and leadership of systems, and then leadership of change. Each participant is given access to an online resource where it, it provides more information in relation to the top topics that we cover in each of the se sessions. So one of the exercises that we ask participants to undertake is a 360 degree review of their own leadership styles. So they fill in a completed assessment by themselves and then request support and feedback from their peers that they're supporting. Each delegate who attends the program are asked to think about a project that they may want that they want to work on towards embedding strengths-based working within their organization. And the content of the, the course that we facilitate gives them the tools to enable them to happen. So some of the projects that we have covered um, has been developing a one council approach to supporting children and families that are homeless um, through to updating supervision policy to make sure that it is, um, you know, that it enables practitioners to have strength based conversations with their managers as well reviewing care processes for adults with social care needs in prison and strengthening independent advocacy support for families within children, uh, you know, within child protection um, planning processes. Next slide, please. Yeah, and, and as we said earlier, that there's not much um, research around leadership in, in social work and social care, and there's even less research in terms of how do we develop leaders in social work and social care. So one of the things that we want to do with the programme is one, to give people a good experience, but also to understand what, how does this programme make a difference? Does it make a difference? Could we do it better? Is there particular insights we've got there for some of the tra trade-offs we have to do between giving people lots of activities, but making it something they can actually achieve in their workplace and their organisation can support? So we've got a, an independent research at the university undertaking an evaluation of uh, the programme and looking at different levels from you know, people's immediate experience to what they've learned to how their behaviour has changed and then most importantly of all how does that lead to different results and outcomes um, for, for individuals and the communities they support. Um, and we're still uh, in the process of the evaluation so it's too early to tell you as yet what we find out uh, but some of the initial feedback from participants seems to be um, really positive and, and part of it I think is yes it's the resources it's it's the you know the kind of engagement they have but actually as much of it is about the time and I think what we're really terrible at in in social care is saying to people you can have the time to reflect in your leadership role so we recognize that actually people need to do that as practitioners and we build in supervision which I think is something we generally do quite well in adult social care but we don't do that for our, our, our people in leadership and actually leadership is a complicated complex uncertain practice as well that requires a, a huge amount of use of self um, and consideration of how you've engaged with somebody what's led to a positive dynamic what's been a, a less positive dynamic um, and so just giving people the opportunity I think to reflect to engage to meet with peers probably by itself would lead to a lot of development um, alongside um, the other activities and content that we have but what we really need to see at the end of the evaluation well what, what has actually changed in people's behavior um, and from their perspective but also their, their their managers and also their external people and stakeholders they engage with so um I, I might um i might just uh, i might just stop there dan and we've got a few kind of slide at the end that we might share about other opportunities but it's probably a good time i think to stop there and to see if there are any questions or if anybody, everybody's drifted off um to their lunch time so it's looking to me like uh, the people listening have been very engaged as i'm sure they would be because it's been absolutely fascinating um one of the first comments we had actually was from amanda who points out external factors such as the court do not always value the strength-based approach we social workers take 
So sometimes we have to negotiate to satisfy them. And I guess that must be a real challenge for leaders as well. It's not just a question of leading the staff, but also influencing um, uh, others around you. No, it's an ex excellent point and, and, and absolutely right. And that's the thing with leadership, isn't it? I mean, we, 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 we sort of know, and it's bizarre. It's bizarre in some ways that when organizational studies started, they only looked at organizations and in their inner context. And they had kind of had this idea of organizations being these separate entities and it is really important what happens in an organization. All of us experience good and bad leadership uh, in our organizations, whether it's local authority or indeed universities. But actually, we survive in a system, don't we? And the relationships uh, and the, that we have and the interactions we have with these wider um, stakeholders is absolutely key. So part of the social care leadership task is not only to try and shape they're inside their organization, but actually to shape external to that as well. And that's why it does require a whole leadership contribution and sometimes there are there are particular um uh, influences that the more senior people are better placed to take because they've got those relationships um and that may well be an example of that where they can use their kind of um uh, sort of more high level partnership and their kind of influence with uh, government etc to try and say to courts look you want you want good outcomes for for individuals and families so do we but you've got to change your behavior and give us that creativity so it's an, it's an excellent point i think and Rebecca has commented, leadership is about listening to your staff, engagement and doing the right thing. Do you think she's, uh, do you think she's captured the three biggest factors there for you? Paula, do you want to respond to that one? Yes, but it, it's about active listening, though, not, not just listening and, you know, taking on board the ideas that an individual may have that's different to yours as a leader. So, you know, we have our own set of of ways in which we think it can be done and we might demonstrate that we're listening but actually we're not because we know that we're already right so it could be you know more more active listening and actually um you know taking on board what is what is being offered that might be a different viewpoint to us and i think that's right paul and i think this is thing going back to this we talked briefly about the idea of followers and the followership leader um, interaction and i think sometimes leaders particularly when they're kind of perhaps new to leadership roles what, what they sort of want is quite a compliant group of followers um, where, uh, you know, they can kind of sit out of the vision and explain what they're going to do, then everyone will get behind it. And, and sometimes that happens, but actually that often nobody gets it right first time. And sometimes there's much more nuance or perhaps a different way of looking at things. And I actually think when people become more um, confident in their leadership, what they want is they want engaged followers. They want people who will support them when they get it right, but equally will say to them, no, I don't think that is the best way to do that. I don't think we, we you know, let's talk about this. You, you want a set of followers that are actually contributing and taking responsibility. So yeah, like Paula said, it's, it is listening, but it's active listening and it's responding and it's, and it's being open to, to some new solution emerging that you perhaps didn't see right at the beginning. Thank you. Um, one housekeeping uh, thing to, to make people aware of is that the slides will be emailed out to participants in the webinar. Uh, and just checking, is the citation for the Dugala Owl study uh, included in your... Um, it is. There's a little link at the bottom. Yeah. In, and, if in, if in and if there's anything you can find you want to see, just drop, email Paul and I's details at the end of the slides. Um, so just, just get in contact and we'd love to send you things that might be useful and also carry on the discussion. So, yeah, but the link Wonderful. is there. Thank you. Thank you. And um, a question from Stella. Would you agree that strengths based work is about the way we all work together? It is a culture that everyone buys into and includes us recognizing how we conduct our own relationships and explores this through strengths-based supervision uh, and modeling this as leaders? I, I think the answer to that would be yes. I think it's, it absolutely is, isn't it? And it's a not a nonsense. And what you what you can do is you can expect practitioners to um, demonstrate strength-based practice in the way that they work with, 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 with individuals, families, and communities when their day-to-day -day reality is, is not strength-based and actually it's much more bureaucratic, dictatorial, they're not being valued, they're not being respected, they're not being given the creativity and the opportunity to express that. So it has to be the organizational culture is absolutely key to the practice condition that people then um, interact with people externally. So so yes, and, and there's, a, there's a whole model actually, again, a, a private sector model leadership called strength-based leadership, handily enough. And what that says is that it says about, um, what we often do in, in organizations is we start off with what people can't do and we say look Dan you're really good at lecturing um, but what you're really not good at is you're not really good at 
writing, for example. So what we'll do is we'll put Dan on lots of courses so he gets better at writing. And yes, there's a degree to which you have to have a basic competence, but actually that can make Dan very demoralized because then Dan's thinking all I do all day is stuff that I'm not very good at. What I really love to do is I love to communicate and engage and speak. And so therefore what we should do is give people that opportunity to flourish. And then how we balance it off is we look across the team and then in the team there's Paula and what Paula loves to do is just to write. So we, you know, we don't just, so we kind of work with the team and the strengths in our team. And I think that's, although it's a private sector model, I think there's a lot of truth in that in terms of um, trying to understand the overall task and responsibilities of a particular team and then thinking how we play to the strengths of the individuals to do that. So yeah, the, 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 the comment on, we need to have strength-based supervision and sort of strength-based culture to then enable people and support them to demonstrate on their practice is absolutely dead on. Mm. And I, I guess that links to, to, to Donald's uh, question. Don, Donald says, great uh, presentation, um, uh, but he wonders if you could say a bit more about how a strength-based approach might deal with difficult stuff. So things like challenging staff um, or challenging a team on its performance. Paul, do you want to go to that? Yep. Yes, my, my um, response to that is, is that if there's buy-in to the way in which we're working within teams, then that challenge may be less because they understand, you know, that our practice is underpinned by the values of strength-based person-centred practice. Um, and so perhaps if, if they're not on board or they don't understand um, the vision, that's where the challenge can come in. That's where, the, the, the you know, the, the barriers do, you know, come from I think and so it is it is about that you know finding out what their barriers are what's not working for them listen coach understand you know why they're resistant to change and then work with them and, and over you know go through the, the challenges that they're facing yeah, I think that's right and I, th and I think a big part of this leadership role is go back to the kind of adaptive leadership it's it's sharing with the team the group of, of followers a group of individuals to say look this isn't going that well you know we aren't getting this right and we collectively have to work out what we need to do differently in order to um improve the support that we give to to individuals and their families so you know leadership is is is, is often a difficult and quite lonely journey but but actually as a positive you present that in a way that people can see where it's coming from in terms of values, they can see why you are, 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 are trying to, to challenge what's currently happening um, and you're trying to engage people in finding the solution. Most people, not all people, and that's the reality, sometimes leadership, you can't convince everybody. Um, it, most people will, will engage with that. And actually, I think the other thing is that people generally respect if you are calling something out, if you're calling it out on a, on, on a good basis, on a strong footing, I think people generally respect that. And I see what people don't respect in a leader is where somebody just enables poor practice to carry on and, and that then people become very disillusioned and disenfranchised why should i do something differently because actually you know this just carries on as ever and that is part of the part of leadership role yeah so being strength based doesn't mean never addressing problems and challenges then. oh goodness no yeah yeah. As long as it's in line with the, the the values of being strength based that the challenge is taking place of course <laughs> yeah, yeah. Question from Michael. Social care, especially these days, is focused on outcomes. How do you reconcile it with strengths-based leadership when ultimately the emphasis is on outcome, regardless of how they're achieved? Oh, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, so I, I suppose I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily see the there's a conflict there in terms of um, outcomes. If you're setting outcomes in terms of people's well-being. Um, you know, people being able to achieve what they want to in, in their life, people feeling safe. I, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily see the conflict between that and and strength based um, practice. Uh, if, if I'm being, if I'm being honest, and the fact that we're looking at outcomes actually says that there's not one route to get to those outcomes. Actually, there's multiple different routes that we could take, and that's what strength based is about because it's about individuals in their community context. So. I'm not I'm, so I'm not I'm not sure I see the the, the conflict um there's always something about how we actually assess outcomes isn't it I know what we often do is we say 
what we want is we want to achieve these kind of holistic outcomes, but then what we actually measure is a very strict set of activity finance based things because that's what our systems allow us to measure and, and i absolutely see if that's the point i completely get why there'd be conflict there um, but again that's going back to this adaptive challenge that's saying our technical solution to understanding outcomes is not fit to what we want to achieve and therefore um we have to have a more holistic way of understanding what difference we've made to people so yeah Mm. Which is exactly what Rebecca just posted in the comments, actually, that strength, uh, seeing that strengths based uh, practice is about seeing things within a, a, a holistic way. So, uh, yeah, it was it, just as you said it, it flashed up on the screen there. Which Perfect. Was nice. yeah, um, I, sorry, I was just going to say I agree with Amanda that it's not just in the conversations that we have, but how we record them. Mm. But then we do face the barrier of, of if we kind of force down a specific way of recording things because we need to generate a personal budget, for example, if, if a person needs a clear and support plan or um, and, and yes. Yeah, so, yes, we, the, the recording it systems need to reflect strength base too. Mm. Dan, yeah. shall I quickly give people a quick heads up to the things we're doing just so they can keep an eye out for them? Please do, yeah. I'll do, very, I'll do very quickly. Uh, so first of all, uh, Sky are developing a critical review tool, which will set out um, uh, nine domains which are to help people to implement strength-based practice um, and to measure the impact. Uh, University of Birmingham, we've been doing a big study over the last three years on uh, funded by the School for Social Care Research, which is about how do we not just use one strength based approach to local authority? So, how do we not just use local air coordination or asset based community development or three conversations? How do we use a collection of those in one area and make sure that they, they complement and they build on each other but don't duplicate? And that report will be out in September. We're also doing some work with the National uh, Applied Research Coll uh, Collaboration, which looks at the implementation of community-led support, which is the big NDTI systems change program. And one of the focuses on that evaluation will be on leadership and culture. Uh, so that's something to look out for. We're doing four nations work on leadership uh, in different parts of the nation. And we're also trying to connect up with international people. So we had a fantastic talk last Tuesday for World Social Work Day from the New York Silver School of Social Work, which was all about leadership and how they've embedded that in the curriculum. And I just raised those, Dan, because to say, look, please get in contact. We are generally really enthusiastic about the contribution of leadership strength-based practice. And we would love to hear from people, whether you're practitioners or academics, to carry on the conversation and involve you and to grow a big network of people who kind of look in this and are passionate about it and want to understand how we can do it better. Uh, great. And that's our details there, which will be on the slides as well. Well, thank you very much. It seems we've come to the uh, the end of our hour together, and um, I, I can see from the uh, from the chat that um, uh, this could have gone on uh, an awful lot longer. So um, I'm sure that people will want to avail themselves of your of your contact details. So um, thank you very much to to Robin and Paula for um, for a really interesting and really insightful. Uh, talk and thank you to those who've who've contributed to the chat and 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 also to those who who've just come along and and listened and and I'm sure that you will have uh, gained a lot from it so so thank you everyone okay and thanks Dan and Sean for organising today all right and have a good have a good rest of Monday everybody thanks very much thank you everyone. <laughs>